हेलो एवरीवन वेलकम टू फिजिक्स वाला इंग्लिश यूट्यूब चैनल आई एम शालिनी सोमशेखर योर बॉटनी टीचर एंड इन टुडे सेशन वी आर गोइंग टू बी स्टार्टिंग विद अ ब्रांड न्यू चैप्टर कॉल्ड एनाटॉमी ऑफ फ्लावरिंग प्लांट्स इन द प्रीवियस लेक्चर वी हैड फिनिश्ड द चैप्टर मोर्फोलॉजी ऑफ फ्लावरिंग प्लांट्स व्हाट डिड वी लर्न इन दैट चैप्टर we learned about the external features of different plant parts like root stem leaves flowers fruits and seed following that we also learned about the semi technical description of three very important angiosperm families solanaceae fabaceae and liliaceae i hope all of you have gone through all of the lectures understood all the concepts correctly and mastered the chapter morphology of flowering plants so moving on in this chapter anatomy of flowering plants i'll tell you what we will basically be dealing with we are going to deep dive into the world of plants and learn about the different types of tissues that we see within plants i'm sure you've covered structural organization in animals in zoology already this chapter can be thought of as the botany counterpart of structural organization in animals in structural organization you learnt about the different types of animal tissues right you learnt about epithelial tissue connective tissue muscular tissue neural tissue you learnt about its features and also about where exactly they are located within the body very similarly in this chapter you're going to be learning about the different types of tissues that we find in plants and also learn about where exactly those tissues are located in the different plant organs like root stem and leaves all right so we can broadly divide this chapter into two parts in the first part we will focus on all the different types of tissues that we can find in plants we will learn about its structure we will learn about its function and in the second part we are going to learn where exactly and how exactly are those tissues arranged in the plant organs like root stem and leaves all right i hope uh, you will stay till the end of the session and understand this well let's begin the session so since this is the first lecture of this particular chapter we will be starting by learning about the plant tissues after you've learned about all the different types of plant tissues you can find in plants we are going to focus on something called tissue systems so towards the end of this lecture you would have understood what plant tissues are and what plant uh, tissue systems are let's begin by trying to understand what the term anatomy means anatomy is the study of internal structure in morphology you learnt about the external features how are the leaves arranged on the stem how are how is the calyx or the sepals arranged in the flower how are the ovules arranged in the ovary you learnt about its morphological features right here over here in anatomy we are going to learn about the internal structure of plants so anatomy is a branch of biology that deals with the study of internal structure of living organisms in this case it is flowering plants or angiosperms so in order to understand what are the different tissues that are present inside of plants it's very important for, for us to cut open the plant and observe it right unless you cut it and look at what is present inside you will not know what kind of tissues are present in an organism so in this uh, chapter we are going to be learning about the different tissues that are present in different plant parts and how we get to know what tissues are present where or what are the features of a particular tissue you cut open the plant and you observe it and you make your note that is how we get to know the different tissues its types where they are located and all of it so all of that is going to be covered through the course of this chapter so that's about what anatomy means now let's talk about tissues i'm sure you might have heard the term tissues since your lower grades right and it may have been a very important one mark definition in your board exams as well so i'm pretty sure that all of you have kind of memorized the definition of tissues so what are tissues tissues are a group of cells these group of cells will have a common origin and perform the same job okay so a group of cells that have a common origin they have originated from the same kind of cell and they perform the same function they perform a common job then we refer to that group of cells as tissues now when it comes to plant tissues we can broadly categorize plant tissues into two types the first type is meristematic tissue and the second type is permanent tissue now you might be wondering what is the basis for this classification 
This classification is based on whether the cells in that particular tissue have the ability to divide or not. Okay, so based on whether the cells have the ability to divide, we can categorize plant tissues into these two types. The first type is meristematic tissue. Meristematic tissues will have cells that have the ability to undergo cell division. So the cells in the meristematic tissues are actively dividing. These are the cells that will cause uh, the growth of plants. Okay, so you have cells, they keep on dividing, dividing, dividing and increasing in number. One cell becomes two cells, those two cells further divide and become four cells, four cells become eight cells. So these cells, meristematic uh, cells in these tissues, they are responsible for the uh, growth of the plant. Okay, so they keep on dividing and increasing the number of cells in the plant body. Then we have permanent tissues. Permanent tissues are those tissues that have lost the ability to divide. Okay, so these are not actively dividing cells. How do permanent tissues form? Some of the meristematic tissues, cells in the meristematic tissue, which are constantly dividing, they lose their ability to divide and they take up specific permanent functions in the plant. Once they take up permanent functions in the plant, they become specialized according to the job they want to do. They are said to be permanent tissues or mature tissues. So these permanent tissues come from meristematic tissues. Meristematic tissues are constantly dividing, causing the growth of the plant. One subset of cells in the meristematic tissue, they stop dividing, they lose the ability to divide, they become specialized and take up specific functions in plants, then they become permanent tissues. Usually permanent tissues will not divide any further. Okay, so these permanent tissues are derived from meristematic tissues, but they don't have the ability to divide. So they are not actively dividing cells. All right. So this is the broad classification of plant tissues based on whether the cells in the tissue have the ability to divide or not. All right. Now let's focus on meristematic tissue first. We'll talk about meristematic tissue first and then we'll move on and learn about the different types of permanent tissues. What is meristematic tissue? The word meristematic tissue is derived from a Greek word which is called meristos. Okay, so meristos is a Greek word. In Greek, the term meristos means to divide or divided. Since these tissues have cells that are constantly undergoing cell division, this tissue is called meristematic tissue. Okay, uh, you might have come across terms like meristems also. Now this meristematic tissue that I'm talking about which has cells that are constantly undergoing division, you do not find them throughout the plant. There are specific regions where these meristematic tissues are located. So those specialized regions where you can find the meristematic tissue are referred to as meristems and in those meristems you can find actively dividing cells. Okay. So meristems are specialized regions in plants where active cell division will occur. Now, one thing is clear, meristematic tissue has cells that are constantly undergoing cell division. By means of undergoing cell division, it is going to cause increase in the uh, size of the plant. It is going to help in the growth of the plant. Secondly, these meristematic tissues are not found throughout the plant. They are found only in specific regions. And those specialized regions where you find this tissue are called meristems. And there obviously you will find cells that are actively dividing. Now that I said that you don't find them everywhere in the plant, we can classify meristematic tissue based on where exactly they are located. There are various ways in which you can classify meristematic tissue. But one of the ways in which you can classify them is based on where they are located. Okay, so this classification of meristematic tissue is based on its location. Where is it located? It will usually be located in the growing regions of the plant. So it is uh, located in the tips of roots and shoots. So if you take a plant, this is the soil, this is the root, you can find them 
at the tips tips of shoot and root are obviously the growing regions plant will grow in length because of the metastomatic tissue that is present at their tips remember tips are also called apices that is plural or apex singular so the metastomatic tissue that is located at the root tip and the shoot tip or the root apex and the shoot apex they are referred to as apical meristems meristematic tissue three types based on location the meristems that are located at the root tip and the shoot tip are called apical meristems second one is intercalary meristem what is inter mean you would have heard of the term inter class competition inter college competition so inter means in between right so inter means between intercalary meristem will occur in between mature tissues now what are mature tissues they are nothing but are permanent tissues so within the plant you will find meristematic tissues as well as permanent tissues if the meristematic tissue is present in between the permanent tissues in plants we refer to it as intercalary meristem so the location here is going to be in between the permanent tissues now let's talk about the third type of meristem which is lateral meristem what does lateral mean in general english lateral means side right present towards the side so these are located at the side of the plant for example when you take a stem let's say this is a dicot stem these are found only in dicots this is one thing that you will have to remember so if you think this is a dicot stem you have the leaf here if you take a section of this dicot stem like assume this is your dicot stem and you're cutting it like this transversely and if you look at that section you can see that the lateral meristem is present in the form of a ring inside so within this like a ring the lateral meristem will be present but if you take a section like this you can see two lines on the side okay so it is like a cylinder inside if you take a longitudinal section you can see it on the sides because you can see it on the sides of the stem or the sides of the root in dicots we refer to such meristems as lateral meristems because they are present on the sides okay so they're not just present on the sides they're present in the form of a ring in a transverse section you can see it like a ring but if you take a longitudinal section you can see it on the sides okay because in the longitudinal section it appears to be present on the sides we refer to it as lateral meristem so where are these found they are found in the mature regions of the roots and shoots of many plants like dicots you can find this in gymnosperms as well but this chapter is dealing with flowering plants or angiosperms so let's just focus on angiosperms all right so that's about the classification of the meristematic tissue based on where exactly the meristematic tissue is present now let's deal with each of these one after one starting with apical meristem we learn about each of it in detail okay stay focused now apical meristem like i already mentioned is present at the root tip and the shoot tip right the apical meristematic tissue that is present at the root tip is called the root apical meristem and quite obviously if it is present at the tip of the shoot we will call it shoot apical meristem right so over here you have the root apical meristem here is the drawing or illustration of the shoot apical meristem these are diagrams that are given in your ncrt textbook so you should remember these diagrams and know all of its labels okay now you've already learnt about the different regions in the root right in the previous chapter morphology of flowering plants you learned about the different regions of the root there's a thimble like structure which we call the root cap so this protects 
the region or zone of meristematic tissue right so this is the root apical meristem so that's where the meristematic tissue is located the cells in this root apical meristem is going to divide 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 increase in number and cause the increase in the size of the plant okay so the other labels don't worry about it as of now as we move on you will learn about what these are now let's move on to the shoot apical meristem what you're looking at here seems like a very big diagram large diagram but what you're seeing here in a shoot tip is a very tiny part okay so if you take a stem of any plant angiosperm plant you cut the tip of the stem extreme tip of the stem if you take and cut it look at it under the microscope you will see something like this at the tip of the stem you will find shoot apical meristem just below the tip just a few millimeters or even smaller than that below the tip leaf primordia will arise now what are these leaf primordia primordia is like a precursor for the leaf so these leaf primordia will eventually give rise to the leaf they will grow and become the leaf okay so at the tip you can't see leaves you can see structures that will in future give rise to the leaves okay so those structures which will become leaves in the future are called leaf primordia so when you look at the shoot tip you can see these small leafy extensions that kind of enclose the shoot apical meristem okay so you can see this kind of a structure at the tip you have the shoot apical meristem these leaf primordia arise below it but they extend over the shoot apical meristem okay so these are called leaf primordia so what happens is as the stem starts growing and elongating its axis these will start becoming leaves as they start becoming leaves see for example you have the shoot apical meristem here and these leaf primordia will start becoming the leaves as these become leaves more primordia leaf primordia will form at the apex okay so as this happens at the stem as this elongation of axis happens as the stem grows as the leaf primordia become leaves some of the meristematic cells that are present at the apex will be left behind at the axle of these leaves okay in the last chapter you've learned about what an axil is if you take a stem and a leaf this angle between the leaf and the stem is called the axil so over here in this position some of the meristematic tissues that were present at the shoot apex will be retained or left behind at the axil of the leaves so that forms the axillary bud okay apical meristems are located at the tips of roots and shoots and during the formation of leaves some of the cells in the shoot apical meristem will get left behind uh, from the shoot and they form the apical meristem which will form the i'm sorry it will form the so like i said some of the cells that are left behind from the apical meristem will form the axillary bud you already know what an axillary bud is it is a small structure that is present at the axil of the leaves sometimes it gets modified into a thorn sometimes it becomes a tendril and in some uh, plants the axillary buds uh, transform into a flower sometimes it might produce a branch so the meristematic cells that are present in the axillary bud where did it come from it has come from the cells that are present in the shoot apical meristem when the stem axis was elongating okay so this is one very important thing for you to remember now let's move on and talk about the intercalary meristem like i already mentioned before intercalary meristem is seen between uh, permanent tissues or mature tissues and what is their function you can usually find them in grasses which are monocots and 
whenever some parts of the plant has been grazed upon by herbivorous animals these intercalary meristems help in regenerating that part okay so here is an illustration to show you its location you have intercalary meristem here and here that is present in between permanent tissues at the tip you have apical meristem on the sides you have the lateral meristem so that's all about intercalary meristem now let's talk about lateral meristems lateral meristems like i already told you it will appear on the sides if you take a longitudinal section but if you take a transverse section you will see it like a cylinder or a ring okay so these occur in the mature regions of roots and shoots these are cylindrical so examples of lateral meristems is important for you to remember you have fascicular vascular cambium the first example interfascicular cambium second example cork cambium third example these are examples of lateral meristems okay so more about it in detail we learn in the next lecture for now just remember these examples we are go i'm going to ask you what the examples are in the next lecture so memorize these fascicular vascular cambium interfascicular cambium cork cambium okay um so that's about lateral meristems now there's another way to classify meristematic tissue so far we learned about how you can classify them based on their location another way to classify them is based on since when is it present in the plant has it always been part of the plant's body or has it developed sometime later okay so based on this we can classify meristematic tissue into primary uh, primary meristems and secondary meristems so let's begin by talking about primary meristems what are primary meristems what does the word primary mean primary in general english means first right so these are meristems that are present in the plant body since the beginning what do i mean if it is when i say it is present since the beginning how do angiospermic plants grow and develop they if they undergo sexual reproduction then the plant has to germinate from a seed right so if you have an angiosperm seed let's say seed will germinate it will produce the radical plumule then you have the plant the meristems that have always been present in this plant body from the beginning are called primary meristems now secondary meristems in the plant they develop later okay so they are not always present from the time the plant germinated the secondary meristems are not present they develop later how exactly they develop i'm going to tell you right now this can seem a little confusing so i want your undivided attention right now if there's anything that's bothering you if there's a phone notification or you think about something else bring yourself back to the present forget about everything else and listen to me for the next couple of minutes because this is important if you do not understand this properly then the next lecture you may not be able to follow all right so so far i have told you that primary meristematic tissue is present in the plant since the beginning secondary meristem develop later right so in order for you to understand this easily i will give you a very relatable example now let's say there are 10th grade kids after they pass out of 10th grade they will have many options to pursue right so if they want to study or pursue medicine then they should opt for science or they can opt for commerce if that's where their interest lies or they can take up arts or they can take up music whatever similarly even our meristematic tissues which are constantly dividing will have many options it can either one set of meristematic tissues let's say there are a couple of cells in the meristematic tissues so this is a set of meristematic tissues one subset of these tissues will continue to divide the other subset of tissues will mature and become permanent tissues
these permanent tissues are of so many different types. There's parenchyma, colenchyma, sclerenchyma, xylem. You have many different types of permanent tissues. Okay? So, these meristematic tissues have the option of becoming more than one type of permanent tissue. Okay? So, initially, the meristematic tissue, I will write it in short, I will write MT, that is for meristematic tissue. This will become, let's say, it will choose to become permanent tissue type A. So, this will become permanent tissue type A. Let's say this 10th grade kid chooses to take up science. He wants to pursue medicine, so he takes up PCB in 11th grade. Similarly, these permanent uh, meristematic tissues have chosen to become type A permanent tissue. Sometimes what happens in children is they take up a specific course, but later they will find out that they are not, you know, uh, passionate enough about it or it's not coming to them easily or they're finding it very difficult or they find out that their passion lies elsewhere for whatever reasons some of the students that take up a subject sometimes change their minds and they go back they do not continue here and they think uh, they want to their passion lies elsewhere and for whatever reason they want to choose a different stream altogether. That happens a lot among science students, right? So first they take up science courses, then they might probably think that it's uh, too difficult for them or it's uh, too much of effort. Then they change their mind and they take up commerce or arts. Let's assume there's one child like that. He thought he wanted to be a doctor, but later once he got into the course, he realized that it's he's not cut out for it and then he changes his mind. And then he takes up art or let's say music. So, he wants to learn music and pursue a career in music, okay? So, very similarly, even in meristematic tissues, sometimes what happens is, some of the permanent tissues that have formed, usually what happens is, once meristematic tissues become permanent tissues, I already told you in the beginning of the session also, they lose the ability to divide. That is what makes them distinct from meristematic tissues. But sometimes what happens is some permanent tissues will regain the ability to divide and they will become meristematic again. Okay, very similar to what happened in this case. This 10th grade kid chose science. He thought he was not cut out for it. He went back and then he started studying music. He started learning music so that he can pursue a career in music. Similarly, a meristematic tissue became a type of permanent tissue. Later, it changed its mind for whatever reason. We learn about it in the next lecture. And this will become meristematic again. Okay. And once it becomes meristematic again, it again has the ability to choose between these different types. So, first it was meristematic, became primary uh, permanent tissue type A, it did not like it, it became meristematic again, now it again has the ability to choose to become A, B, C or D. Now let's say it becomes permanent tissue type B. Okay? So this happens in plants. Sometimes this happens only in certain regions, only in certain occasions for certain specific reasons. Why exactly it happens, how it happens, you'll learn in the next lecture. In order for you to understand what primary and secondary meristems are, this understanding is important. Okay? Now, when a meristematic tissue for the first time matures and becomes a permanent tissue, that process is called differentiation. When the permanent tissue changes its mind, becomes meristematic again by gaining, regaining the ability to, to divide, that process is called de-differentiation. Whatever meristem is formed by de-differentiation, okay, 
so this becoming meristematic again that is called uh, d differentiation okay now this d differentiated meristem becoming permanent tissue again this process is called redifferentiation so this meristem which for the first time gave rise to a permanent tissue that is called our primary meristem this meristem which was formed because a permanent tissue d differentiated this is called secondary meristem so when we started off about this categorization i told you that primary meristems have always been present in the plant and secondary meristems develop only later in the life of the plant so this one had always been present this gave rise to the first type of permanent tissue but that permanent tissue did not like it or for some reason d differentiated and became meristematic again if a meristematic tissue is formed in such a way because of d differentiation we refer to such meristems as secondary meristems and whatever examples you learnt about here for lateral meristem fascicular cambium uh, fa uh, fascicular vascular cambium interfascicular cambium core cambium among these lateral meristems interfascicular cambium and core cambium these are secondary meristems okay so don't worry about it much for now i will teach you a way to remember it in the next class for now just remember what primary and secondary meristems are primary meristems have always been present since the beginning of the uh, plant right so once the plant germinated it formed since then the primary meristem had been has been present but these secondary meristems they were not present in the beginning they only develop or arise later because some permanent tissues d differentiated and gained the ability to undergo cell division okay so that's how these secondary meristems are formed so that's about primary meristem and secondary meristem different types of meristematic tissues based on whether they are present in the plant since the beginning or not now let's move on to talk about permanent tissues you may have learnt about some of these in your lower grades i think in ninth grade you've learnt about tissues so you may briefly be aware of what these tissues are what their functions are what their names are but in this chapter in 11th grade you're going to learn about them in a little bit more detail okay so what are these permanent tissues permanent tissues like i already mentioned earlier are those tissues that do not have the ability to divide they have kind of lost the ability to divide and uh, uh, they don't actively divide and they have specific functions to perform in the plant according to what function it has to perform it would have become specialized right like in our jobs we all specialize i want to teach botany so i read more botany i am specialized in botany which is why i can teach botany right so similarly these cells also if it is supposed to perform storage it specializes in in a certain way if it is supposed to conduct water it specializes in a certain way so uh, according to what its job is it becomes specialized in its structure right so these are specialized uh, tissues and uh, it is of two types simple tissues simple permanent tissues and complex permanent tissues now the basis for classifying permanent tissues into simple and complex is the number of types of cells present in it remember number of types of cells and not number of cells obviously if there are tissues there's going to be more than one cell right it's a group of cells how many different types of cells are present in it based on that we classify permanent tissues into simple permanent excuse me into simple permanent and complex permanent so in simple permanent tissues all of the cells in that particular tissue are of the same kind they are homogeneous tissues whereas complex permanent tissues will have cells of many different types or more than one type let's see so i'm using different colors to represent that
okay so over here in complex permanent tissues definitely there's more than one cell present and those cells are of different types if there's more than one type of cell present in a particular tissue we call it complex permanent tissues okay so this have many different types of cells though the types of cells are different they all coordinatedly work together and perform the same function how they do that you'll know in just a bit okay so this is the classification of plant tissues i'm sorry permanent tissues based on the number of types of cells that is present in it now let's focus on simple permanent tissues simple permanent tissues are of three types you have parenchyma colenchyma sclerenchyma i'm sure you've heard of all these chyma chyma kind of tissues in your lower grades so let's move on and start learning about each of them individually starting with parenchyma so parenchyma is the most abundant type of plant tissue that you can see so it's present pretty much in every plant part like the root stem leaves flowers fruits everywhere you can see parenchyma and it is the most abundant type of tissue that you find in plants all right now like i already mentioned it forms a major component within all of the organelles root stem leaves flowers fruits everywhere you can find these generally these are isodiametric what does isodiametric mean iso means what iso means same or similar what does diametric mean obviously it is about the diameter so isodiametric means the diameter of these cells is nearly the same okay so as you can see this is the ncrt illustration the diameter you, if you check in these cells usually it will be nearly the same diameter okay so its shape is variable sometimes it's spherical sometimes it's oval it could be round it could be polygonal it could be elongated so the shape of these cells varies according to where it is present what is its function there the shape can vary what are these cell walls made of cell walls in plants are made up of cellulose right so there could be additional cell wall materials but in these parenchyma cells the cell walls are not very thick it is very thin walls and they are cellulosic in nature which means they are composed of cellulose right and they are closely packed you do not find huge spaces between these cells in the parenchyma but of course some intercellular spaces can be seen as you can see here this is an actual uh, microscopic image of parenchyma cells you can see how these cells are present somewhat closely arranged you can also find spaces between cells which i'm highlighting right now some intercellular spaces will be present the cell walls as you can see are not very thick they are thin and they are composed of cellulose and this is the ncrt diagram even here you can see intercellular spaces are labeled so some amount of intercellular spaces small spaces will be pre present usually in parenchyma okay what are its functions in leaves if it is present it performs photosynthesis if it is present in some storage root like turnip or carrot it can perform storage sometimes if it is lining any um ducts or anything it can secrete its secretions there okay so all of these are some of the functions of parenchyma now let's move on to learn about the second type of simple permanent tissue which is colenchyma so colenchyma usually you find in dicot plants only okay so specifically you can find colenchyma un, uh, in the dicot stem where exactly we learn in the next lecture so it occurs uh, below the epidermis in dicot plants this is found as a homogeneous layer or in patches it may be present as a continuous layer or it can be found in patches here the cells previously in parenchyma i said that the cell wall is cellulosic and it is thin right over here we can find that the cell walls are thick but the cell walls are not uniformly thick it's not like if this is a thin parenchyma at a cell colenchyma will have thick walls this is not it so these cells will have thickenings or will be thick at specific regions 
if you look at the thickness of the cell wall throughout the cell wall uniformly it will not be thick there are certain regions that will be thick there are certain regions that will be thin okay so cells are thickened at the corners you can see in this diagram here this is the cell so this is the cell wall you can see how there are thickenings present at the corners right and what are these thickenings made of they are made up of substances like cellulose hemicellulose and pectin remember this it is important okay now let's talk about the shape of these cholangiomas cells these are usually oval or spherical or sometimes it could even be polygonal in shape these cells generally they contain chloroplast and they help in uh, performing photosynthesis over here you don't see a lot of intercellular spaces intercellular spaces are absent at the corners at the junctions where two cells are present usually the cell walls will be thick okay so you do not find any intercellular spaces in colon chyma tissue over here you can see this is a real uh, microscopic image of colon chyma you can see how even in the intercellular spaces wherever there are spaces there is thickening of the wall and it has uh, completely compactly arranged right so what is the function the function of colon chyma is to provide mechanical support and flexibility to an extent you can find it in young dicot stems okay now Let's move on to learn about sclerenchyma, which is the third type of com uh, simple permanent tissue. So, sclerenchyma consists of cells that are dead at maturity. Parenchyma and colenchyma, both of these are living cells. Sclerenchyma is derived from meristematic tissue, but by the time sclerenchyma matures and takes up its function, it would have lost its cytoplasm, nucleus, everything. So, it will be dead at maturity. okay so usually dead and without protoplastic maturity how is the shape they are very long usually narrow cells with thick and lignified walls remember this important difference parenchyma had thin wall cellulosic colenchyma had walls that were thick in specific regions it was made up of cellulose hemicellulose pectin over here you have very thick walls that will obviously have cellulose but in addition to cellulose it will also have thickenings of lignin it is because lignin is present we say that it is lignified okay so this may have few or numerous pits what does few or numerous pits mean i will tell you you've already learnt about the structure of cell wall in the chapter cell the unit of life right so you will have the middle lamella outermost inside that you will have the primary wall okay so this is a section of the cell this is the primary wall this is the middle lamella inside this you will have the secondary wall over here the middle lamella is composed of calcium pectate the primary wall is composed of cellulose and the thickenings that you see here secondary wall will be made up of lignin so what happens is in some parts of the cell wall the secondary wall will be thin okay so over here the wall will be thin those regions are called pits if this is one cell and on the opposite side you have another cell in this cell also in this region the secondary wall will be thin usually okay so even in this region it's going to be thin so these are called pits and it is through these pits some communication can happen between two cells so if cells are present next to each other in a tissue 
and if they have to perform the same job communication is important right cells have to talk to each other in order to function as a unit and these pits help in those communications okay so if it's very thick it's forming a big barrier for communication so at certain regions in the cell wall the secondary wall will be very thick form depressions usually on both sides of the wall both the cells adjacent to that wall they will have pits in the same region this will help in uh, easing out communication between cells for them to function as a unit okay so in these clearenchyma uh, cells we can see pits like these in their cell walls okay so what is the function of sclerenchyma it is to provide mechanical support mechanical support was the function of colenchyma also so you might get questions like this in your board exam which is a a uh, living mechanical tissue which is the dead mechanical tissue so if you get questions like that living mechanical tissue is colenchyma dead mechanical tissue is clearenchyma all right so yeah again clearenchyma can be classified into two types we have fibers and sclerites and the basis for classifying clearenchyma into fibers and sclerites is the variation in their form structure and origin okay so let's take a look at what these fibers and sclerites are this is a diagram that you have in your ncrt exam uh, textbook this is the illustration of a fiber here you have the diagram of a sclerite so structurally the first look you take at it you can see that they look very different from each other right so what are these fibers sclerenchyma in general has thick walls so these fibers are also thick walled look at their shape they are elongated and they have pointed ends usually they occur in groups one next to each other one top of each other so they form long fibers and these can be seen in various parts of the plant you will learn about it in uh, going forward talking about sclerites again since they are sclerenchyma they will obviously have thick walls within them they will have narrow cavities which is called the lumen okay so why are the cavities here because they are dead cells within the cell there is no cytoplasm there is no nucleus basically they are empty cells okay so they will have lumen look at how thick the wall is right so because the wall is so thick the uh, plants are getting mechanical support from sclerenchyma otherwise plants do not have a rigid skeletal system like us right so if the plant has to remain upright and stand strong against wind and all of that it needs mechanical support and that is provided by these dead cells which are very very important for the plant they are able to provide that degree of mechanical support because of their extremely thick walls right so their shape can be spherical oval or cylindrical usually they are found in the walls of nuts you can find that in the pulp of guava pear and sapota if you consume these kind of fruits guava pear and sapota you can sense a gritty texture right that texture is because of the presence of sclerites in them okay you can also find that in the seed coats of legumes what are legumes now legumes basically are pulses like peas beans all of that and you can also find it in the leaves of tea so these are some places where you can find sclerites now let's move on and talk about complex permanent tissues complex permanent tissues like i already mentioned has cells of more than one type it is of two types complex permanent tissues xylem and phloem both of them are involved in conduction right both of them are vascular tissues xylem is involved in the conduction of water and minerals whereas phloem is involved in the conduction of food across different parts of the plant now since they are complex permanent tissues they obviously must have more than one cell type how many types of cells are exactly present in these both of them have four types of cells each okay so four types of cells are found in these we will look at each of them one by one starting with xylem xylem as i already mentioned is the conducting tissue it conducts water and minerals along with conduction xylem also helps in providing mechanical support okay so like i mentioned earlier 
in xylem you can find four different types of cells that is tracheid vessels which are also called trachea xylem fibers and xylem parenchyma so among these four types of cells that you find in the xylem tissue tracheids are dead vessels are dead fibers obviously sclerenchyma fibers they are dead and xylem parenchyma is the only living tissue because it is comprising of so many dead cells which have thick walls xylem in addition to conducting water and minerals in the plant will also help in providing mechanical support all right now let's talk about each of them individually starting with tracheid so here is a diagram or uh, an image showing you what tracheids look like these are tracheids okay so as you can see they are long and these circles in them they represent the pits that i spoke to you about just a few minutes ago so this also is a tracheid okay so these uh, secondary wall thickenings or the pits they are of different types you can see in these tracheids they are elongated and tube like see the function of xylem is to conduct water if the cell is filled with cytoplasm and organelles conduction of water will not be easy so for conduction of water to happen efficiently effectively the insides of the cell have to be free right it has to be empty only when there is no resistance water can move easily as it is water has to move against gravity imagine if the cells were also filled then it would have made it even difficult for the water to move up against gravity to the leaves right so these cells which are involved in conducting water have empty spaces inside they are dead cells they have thick walls but they will have a lumen inside they will have a space inside through which water can move okay so these have thick lignified walls similar to the cells of the sclerenchyma they have tapering ends as you can see here the ends are pointed and tapering they are dead without pr protoplasm uh inner layers of the walls have thickenings which vary in form that is basically talking about the secondary wall thickenings so different kinds of thickenings can be found in the secondary walls of these plants so these are involved in conduction since they are empty inside water can move through it easily so tracheids can be found in angiosperms as well as gymnosperms okay now let's talk about vessels vessels is very very important because it is a characteristic feature of angiosperms you do not find them in gymnosperms of course there are a few exceptions but in most gymnosperms 99% of gymnosperms vessels are absent okay so vessels are the characteristic feature of angiosperms in fact angio itself means vessel even in uh, uh, zoology you may have learnt angioplasty angio angiogenesis it's about blood vessels right similarly over here angio means vessel they are talking about these vessels because these plants have these vessels they are called angiosperms all right so these are see, here is a vessel as you can see the width is slightly broader than the tracheids they are long cylindrical tube like structures made up of many cells called vessel members okay so many such cylindrical cells lie end to end on top of each other and form vessels each cell in this is called a vessel member okay uh, similar to tracheids they are also dead cells they have very thick walls that are lignified meaning they have lignin in them and they have a space large central cavity which we call the lumen they are dead devoid of protoplasm and these cells are interconnected to each other by means of perforations that are present in their cross walls what are perforations perforations are basically pores okay so pores are holes or holes will be present in their common walls if there's two cells lying one on top of each other at the common walls at the junction of those cells there will be pores present and those pores help in transporting of water 
ओके या लाइक आई ऑलरेडी मैंशन दिस इज द कैरेक्टरिस्टिक फीचर ऑफ एंजियो स्पर्म्स यू डू नॉट फाइंड दैम इन नाइन्टी नाइन परसेंट ऑफ जिमनो स्पर्म्स ऑल राइट नाउ लेट्स मूव ऑन एंड टॉक अबाउट द थर्ड कॉम्पोनेंट ऑफ जाइलम विच इज जाइलम फाइबर्स जाइलम फाइबर्स हैव हाईली थिकंड वॉल्स द वॉल्स ऑफ दीज फाइबर्स आर हाईली थिकंड ऑब्वियसली बिकॉज इट इज अ स्लीर एंड कैमाटिस फाइबर इट इज द कैरेक्टरिस्टिक फीचर ऑफ स्लीर एंड कैमाटिस शू दैट द वॉल्स आर वेरी थिक एंड दे आर डेड राइट सो इट हैज एन ऑबलिटरेटेड सेंट्रल लूमन वॉट डज दैट मीन ऑबलिटरेटेड मीन्स इनिशियली इट यूज टू बी लाइक दिस इट हैड अ लूमन बट द वॉल बिकेम सो थिक that the lumen almost doesn't exist anymore it's almost like the wall has eaten up the space inside it can feel like the wall the lumen never even existed in the first place okay so it is obliterated the wall becomes so thick that it obliterates the central lumen now this may be septate or aseptate it may have cross walls or may not have cross walls okay so septa basically are cross walls that we are talking about now last part xylem parenchyma xylem parenchyma is the only living tissue that is present uh, only living type of tissue present in uh, xylem so these are living cells typical parenchyma thin walled the cell wall is made up of cellulose so this can store food materials in the form of starch fat or tannins remember when i spoke about parenchyma i told you their functions depend on where they are located If they are located in xylem or if they are associated with xylem, then its function would be to store food. Okay. Now that's about xylem. Here you can see how exactly those different types of cells are arranged in xylem as a tissue. So you have tracheids here. You have xylem fibers here. Here you have the wide uh, vessels. Here you have the perforations, right, to help in transport. All these dots that you are looking at here, they are nothing but pits. and we also have xylem parenchyma okay so this is how the different types of cells are arranged in the xylem tissue i hope that is clear now let's move on to learn about primary and sec uh, proto and meta xylem i told you what primary meristematic tissue is right primary and secondary similarly we have primary and secondary xylem primary xylem is the xylem that has existed since the beginning of the plant's life secondary xylem is something that forms later in the life of the plant okay so don't worry much about secondary xylem for now we learn about it in detail in the next lecture but for now just remember primary xylem is a xylem that's present since the beginning of the plant's life okay now this primary xylem is of two types based on when they are formed okay so they are definitely present since the beginning but even then when xylem is forming some of the xylem vessels will be formed earlier and some will be formed later right even in primary xylem it's not like all the xylem vessels always existed some will form earlier some will form later so depending upon which was formed early which was formed late primary xylem can be categorized into two types proto xylem and meta xylem proto xylem as the name itself indicates proto meaning first this is the first form protoxylem elements and these protoxylem elements let me highlight them in red color here they have a small lumen what am i highlighting here this is the cross section that you're looking at if this is a stem or uh, probably a root you're looking at the cross section of it so when you take a section of xylem those vessels that are cylindric cylindrical will appear circular in outline right so these are the vessels that you're looking at so these protoxylem elements will have vessels where the lumen is small and these meta xylem elements that are later formed over here the lumen is relatively larger okay so that's the difference between these two now depending upon how the proto xylem and meta xylem are arranged in the root you can classify them into two types n dark and xr okay so you you know these pens used to exist earlier where you have so many different refills inside the pen and you do this different colored pen, uh, refills whichever color you want you choose and you write with it so you can think of the stem and root like that like that pen and you can think of those multiple refills 
representing the xylem vessels okay so those xylem vessels will be present like this so all of these are xylem vessels 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 all of these are xylem vessels so they are present longitudinally inside the root and stem what you're looking at here is probably a root okay now depending upon where the position of the small protoxylem is protoxylem has a small lumen right depending upon where the protoxylem is located you can classify it into endark and exarc now what does endo mean endo means inside in endark primary xylem you can find the protoxylem is present inside towards the pith inside pith means inside okay so pith is located inside so these protoxylem small xylem elements they are present towards the pith meta xylem is present towards the periphery since protoxylem is inside and this is about protoxylem since protoxylem is inside we call it endark in contrast when you look at exarch protoxylem the smaller xylem elements will be towards the periphery and the larger meta xylem elements will be towards the center in that case we call it exarch exo means outside all right okay i hope this is clear usually endark xylem you will find in stems and exarch xylem you can find in root now let's move on and talk about phloem phloem like i already mentioned is the conducting tissue for food usually food is synthesized where in the leaves so from where it is synthesized to where it is necessary food has to be transported and that job is performed by the phloem okay so similar to xylem even phloem has four different types of tissues we have sieve tube elements we have companion cells we have phloem parenchyma and phloem fibers over here sieve tube elements are living companion cells are living phloem parenchyma is living phloem fibers are sclerenchymatous fibers so they are dead in xylem there have four different types of uh, cells of which three are dead one is living in phloem also you have four different types of cells forming the tissue of which three are living and one is dead okay let's look at them individually starting with sieve tube elements sieve tube elements are the major type of cell through which food transport will take place okay and sieve tube elements are present only in angiosperms it is absent in gymnosperms in gymnosperms instead of sieve tube elements you have sieve cells okay so these are long tube like structures obviously it has to be like a tube because it has to transport food from one plant part to the other right and they are arranged longitudinally they are cylindrical cells arranged longitudinally means similar to vessels they are arranged one on top of each other okay so they are associated with companion cells the second type of cell companion cells we are calling it companion cells because they are always accompanying these sieve tube elements sieve tube elements don't have a nucleus of their own okay so they are living but they lack a nucleus at maturity so in order to con control and monitor the functions of the sieve tube uh, element the nucleus of the companion cells will help okay so it's a very good friend and it uh, monitors the activities and the functions and the metabolic uh, reactions that are taking place in the sieve tube elements okay so usually they are associated with companion cells over here you can see this is a sieve tube element alongside the sieve tube element you also have this companion cell okay so here you have a sieve tube element here you have a companion cell so you're always lying next to each other so at these end walls similar to how we saw perforations in the uh, walls common walls between vessel members in xylem here also in sieve tube elements where there is a common wall you see perforations that is called the sieve plate okay so you will see pores here present at the cross walls or the end walls and that is called the sieve plate okay so the reason why it's called sieve tube is because this has end walls that have a lot of perforations 
in a mature sieve tube element cytoplasm is present remember it is living cytoplasm is present cytoplasm will be towards the periphery over here you can find the cytoplasm in the center you will have a large vacuole okay it lacks a nucleus but how is its function controlled if it doesn't have a nucleus nucleus is like the brain without a brain an organism like us cannot live right so without a nucleus how is the cell surviving thanks to the companion cells the nucleus of the companion cells will control the activity of the sieve tube element okay so that's about the sieve tube elements next let's talk about companion cells companion cells are also specific or exclusive to angiosperms you do not find them in gymnosperms gymnosperms instead of companion cells will have cells called albuminous cells which perform a similar function so these are basically specialized cells that are parenchymatous in nature they are very very closely associated with sieve tube elements which is why they are called companion cells and the sieve tube element and the companion cells are connected to each other by fit pit walls present between the common longitudinal walls see this is the common longitudinal wall let me use a different color um let's use black so this is a common longitudinal wall that is present between this sieve tube element and this companion cell so in this cross wall you will find pits i told you already what pits are so pit fields are those areas in the cell wall where you find a lot of pits okay so through these pit fields the two cells will be connected uh when you learn about how exactly phloem transports food you will get to know that a specific certain amount of pressure has to be maintained in phloem in order for it to transport food and these companion cells help the uh sieve tube elements in maintaining that pressure so that it can transport food uh effectively okay so they help in maintaining the pressure gradient in the sieve tubes very very important you should take inspiration from these companion cells and be a good friend to your friends okay so that's about companion cells next we have phloem parenchyma usually it is absent in monocots you find it mostly in the dicots itself these here are elongated tapering and cylindrical cells like all parenchyma cells they have a prominent nucleus then cytoplasm cell wall that is made up of cellulose over here the cell wall will have certain pits through which plasmodesmata connections exist plasmodesmata basically are cytoplasmic connections that exist between neighboring cells so over here the function of phloem parenchyma is to store food material and certain other substances like resins latex and mucilage Okay so that's about phloem parenchyma talking about phloem fibers which are nothing but sclerenchyma fibers so they are also called bast fibers xylem fibers are also called wood fibers phloem fibers are also called bast fibers in fact phloem fibers are economically commercially very important you may have uh, seen bags made out of jute right you get jewelry made out of jute you get footwear made out of jute you get sarees and clothes and all of that so the fibers that they use to make a uh, things out of jute are usually the phloem fibers so it is commercially important okay so jute flax and hemp whatever is used to make the products are usually the phloem fibers so phloem fibers are nothing but sclerenchyma cells usually they are absent in primary phloem but you can find them in secondary phloem what is primary phloem secondary phloem similar to primary xylem and secondary xylem you have primary phloem and secondary phloem primary phloem is present since the beginning of the plant's life the secondary phloem forms later in life okay so it's absent in primary phloem you can usually find it in secondary phloem these are much elongated and unbranched have pointed needle like apices very typical of fibers cell walls are obviously thick because it is sclerenchymatous and it is composed of lignin it will have very thick uh, lignified walls they are dead definitely because it is sclerenchymatous they lose protoplasm become dead used commercially so similar to how we had protoxylem and metaxylem in primary xylem we have protofloem and secondary phloem in primary phloem okay so protofloem is first formed the sieve tubes will have a narrow diameter metaphloem is later formed the sieve tubes here will have a relatively larger diameter
Okay, so that's about phloem. So with this, we have finished the different types of tissues that you see in plants. Now it's time for us to move on and learn about plant tissues. I'm sorry, tissue systems. So what are these tissue systems? Tissue systems are specific types of tissues that you find in specific regions of the plant. These tissue systems can be categorized into three types. First is the epidermal tissue system. Second is the ground tissue system. Third is the vascular tissue system. Okay. So, epidermal tissue system can be thought of as like the epithelial tissue you find in animals. You've already covered that chapter, so I'm giving you this example. You know how an animal's epithelial tissue covers the external surface, it covers the lining of our internal surfaces, it covers our organs, right? So, it is protective in function, very similar to epithelial tissue in animals. In plants, we have the epidermal tissue. You take any part of the plant, roots, stem, leaves, any part you want, the outermost layer that covers it and protects whatever is lying inside is the epidermal tissue. Okay? So, epidermal tissue, you have the, uh, if you think of this as a section of the stem, let's say you're taking a section of the stem, outermost whatever is present, that is the epidermal tissue system. Now, let's talk about vascular tissue system. Vascular tissue system includes xylem and phloem. So, these are present towards the inside of the plant. Okay? So, this xylem and phloem represents the vascular tissue system. You can think of it as, uh, let's say, blood vessels. You know, blood vessels in us animals, it helps in transporting substances from one part of the body to another. Similarly, vascular tissues in plants helps in transport of water and food across different parts of the plant. Alright? Now, whatever else is present apart from epidermal tissue and ground tissue is what the, uh, I'm sorry, epidermal tissue and vascular tissue, that is what is the ground tissue. Everything else that is present apart from Epidermal tissue and vascular tissue is our ground tissue system. Okay, so ground tissue system can be thought of as like the connective tissue. What does the connective tissue do in our bodies? In animals, connective tissues connect different organs and tissues together and keeps them intact, right? So, very similarly, even in plants, outermost you have epidermis, towards the inside you have xylem and phloem, whatever filling substances are there in between, those tissues are called uh, ground tissue system. Okay? So, that's about uh, the three different types of uh, tissue systems based on their structure and location. Location, important because outermost is epidermal, innermost is vascular bundles, in between is ground tissue. Okay? Now, let's talk about each of them individually, starting with the epidermal tissue system. So, what is this epidermal tissue system? Like I already mentioned, it is the outermost covering of the whole plant body. If it's covering the outermost layer, if it is being the outermost layer entire plant body, what is its function? Its function obviously has to be protection, right? Anything that's present in the outermost region obviously offers protection for whatever is lying inside. That is exactly what epidermal tissue also does. So, here, in the epidermal tissue, you can find epidermal cells, you can find stomata, you can find epidermal appendages in the form of trichomes and hair. Now, let's talk about how the epidermal cells are. Epidermal cells are compactly arranged, elongated, continuous layer. Usually, they are parenchymatous. Remember when I told you about the characteristics of parenchyma cells, I mentioned that they are usually isodiametric and you don't find a lot of intercellular spaces between them. I mean, you do find a little bit of uh, intercellular spaces between them. But over here, in these cells, in the epidermis, you do not find intercellular spaces because it is protective in function. It's trying to protect the plant, right? If there are any spaces in that layer, then... Uh, viruses that can cause diseases in plants or bacteria or fungi or whatever can cause disease in plants can gain entry into the plant and cause infection. So, its function is to protect the plant. Therefore, whenever parenchyma is present in the epidermis, usually you do not find any spaces in there. So, usually 
they are compactly arranged and continuous layer you do not find a lot of intercellular spaces here generally they are single layered but in some plants you also find multi layered epidermis but that's a rare thing okay now how are these cells? In the cells, there's a small amount of cytoplasm linking the cell wall and the large vacuole. So, if you take this as the cell, you have the cell wall, you have the cell membrane, and you have the nucleus, you have a large central vacuole. This is the nucleus, and whatever is lying here, this will be the cytoplasm. Okay, so cytoplasm kinds of forms a small layer that links the vacuole and the cell wall. So, on the outside surface of the epidermis, you can find cuticle. So, now I am talking about the cuticle. So, if you think this is a section of the stem, okay, a transverse section, outermost layer cells will be arranged like this, compactly arranged barrel shaped cells. On the outer surface of these cells, you can sometimes find the deposition of a waxy substance that is called the cuticle. What is the function of cuticle? Cuticle helps in preventing water loss that happens by means of transpiration. Okay, So, it helps in conserving water for the plant. Now, this cuticle is not present in the below ground parts of the plant like roots. You can see them in stems, young stems, you can definitely see the cuticle. And on leaves also, you can find the presence of cuticle. But in underground parts like roots, cuticle is absent. Okay. Now, these epidermal cells also bear hair. Remember when you studied about the different regions of root and morphology of flowering plants, you learnt about a zone of maturation right where you learnt about a zone of root hair root hair helps in absorption of water uh, more efficiently water and minerals by increasing the surface area so in roots definitely in the outermost layer you see epidermis and these epidermal cells will give out root hair like that that are unicellular so root hair will be unicellular elongations they help in absorption of water and minerals from the soil Similarly, you can find hair in stem as well. This, let's say this is the root. These are root hair that are unicellular. Stem also, sometimes if you've seen certain stems, young herb, uh, herbaceous stems, you can see um, hair-like structure that arises from the surface of the stem. right? So, those also are arising from the epidermis itself, which is why we call them epidermal appendages. Unlike the root hair that are unicellular, these epidermal appendages are, I'm sorry, these uh, stem hair are multicellular and we call them trichomes. They help in minimizing water loss. Okay, So, stem hair are called trichomes. Usually, they are multicellular. They may be branched or unbranched. They may be soft or stiff. Sometimes, they may be secretory as well. They help in preventing water loss that happens by transpiration. So, we've talked about epidermal cells, we've talked about cuticle, we've spoken about trichomes and hair, what's left is stomata. So, let's take a look at what stomata are. I'm sure you've heard of stomata, you've looked at this diagram multiple times in your lower grades. So, what are stomata? Basically, stomata are pores that are present on the surface of the leaves. Uh, mostly on the leaves, but sometimes you can find them in young stems as well. Since they are present at the surface, they are located in the epidermis. Okay, So, stomata is the plural form, stoma is the singular form. Stomata are structures present in the epidermis of leaves. They regulate the process of transpiration and gaseous exchange. Remember, plants also uh, gaseous exchange needs to take place, right? Plants take in carbon dioxide to photosynthesize, they release oxygen, there has to be way out for these gases to move into and out of the plant. If the, um, what do we say, epidermis is fully compact with no, absolutely no spaces at all, then that gaseous exchange will not be able to take place. So, in order to allow for gaseous exchange and also in order for transpiration to occur, pores are required. But the uh, special thing about these stomata is that they are not always open. They open and close based on the physiological state of that plant at that particular time. If the plant needs oxygen or carbon dioxide gaseous exchange or whatever, then it will open it. If the job is done, 
the pore can close okay so each stoma has two bean shaped cells called guard cells they are bean shaped in dicots but in monocots they are dumbbell shaped so this is the stomatal pore this is the pore as you can see you have two this is cell number 1 this is cell number 2 okay so two cells that are bean shaped or kidney shaped they are forming an opening in dicots similarly you have two dumbbell shaped cells that are forming a pore in monocots now these cells are called guard cells why do you think we should call them guard cells because you're doing the job of guards right you know what security guards do in apartments and houses and offices right they ensure and i mean they they are in control of who they let in and who they let out similarly over here these are in control of opening and closing of the stomatal pore okay so uh, what i was going to say now is that outer walls of these guard cells are thin these walls are thin and the inner walls are thick they possess chloroplast usually epidermal cells do not possess chloroplast but these cells possess chloroplast and like i already mentioned they regulate the opening and closing of stomata sometimes in some plants what happens is the epidermal cells that are immediately surrounding these guard cells like right next to the guard cells they become specialized and they will start appearing slightly different from the uh, other epidermal cells like over here you can see these cells here look at these cells here 1 2 3 4 these four cells that i have outlined right now these are also epidermal cells these are also epidermal cells look at how these four cells look very different from the other epidermal cells they become specialized and these cells are called subsidiary cells sometimes around the guard cells you can see some epidermal cells in the immediate vicinity that are specialized and they are called subsidiary cells so when stomatal pore guard cells subsidiary cells together we refer to it as stomatal apparatus okay stomatal aperture is nothing but the stomatal pore stomatal pore plus guard cells plus our subsidiary cells together it is called stomatal apparatus okay so you might uh, be asked to draw the diagram of stomatal apparatus for one or two marks in your board exams so all you need to do is label stomatal pore guard cells subsidiary cells and we are done okay so that's about the uh stomata now let's talk about vascular tissue then we'll come back to the ground tissue okay so vascular tissue includes permanent tissue xylem and phloem uh xylem and phloem together they are called the vascular bundles depending upon how these vascular bundles are arranged within a plant organ like root stem or leaves we can categorize them into these following types the first type is radial vascular bundle in radial vascular bundles xylem and phloem are separate they are not present together in one bundle as you can see here this is the innermost region let's say this is the epidermis here you have the ground tissue this is the epidermis inside you have xylem and phloem you look at this as a circle think of it as a circle at this radius you have xylem at this radius you have phloem at this radius you have xylem at this radius you have phloem here you have xylem phloem xylem phloem right here the xylem and phloem are not present together in the same radius xylem and phloem are present alternatively in different radii therefore we refer to it as radial arrangement of vascular bundle okay in conjoint within the same radius you can find both so within this you can find both xylem and phloem towards the inner side you have xylem outside you have phloem inside you have xylem outside you have phloem within the same radius within the same bundle you can find xylem and phloem such a type of vascular bundle arrangement is said to be the second type which is conjoint arrangement 
Now, depending upon whether what you are looking at here is one such vascular bundle. Okay. So, depending upon whether in between the xylem and phloem there is cambium or not, you can categorize them further into open and closed vascular bundles. Whichever vascular bundles have a strip of cambium present between the xylem and phloem, such vascular bundles are said to be open, conjoint open vascular bundles. If cambium is absent, then we call it closed vascular bundles. Closed vascular bundles are usually seen in monocot stems. Open vascular bundles you can see in dicot stem. Radial arrangement you can see in both dicot as well as monocot roots. Why do we call it open and closed? Cambium, remember I told you, is a type of lateral meristem, right? So, if lateral meristem is there, it is open to secondary growth. If lateral meristem is absent, it is closed for secondary growth. What exactly secondary growth is? Briefly, I will tell you now. Secondary growth is increasing in the girth of the plant. For example, when you take a mango tree, mango tree used to be a small plant, right, which had a very thin stem. But as it grew, the trunk of the tree grew bigger and bigger and became a wide trunk. So that is secondary growth. If it increases in girth or diameter, then we call it secondary growth. If you take the example of sugarcane, which is a monocot, as the sugarcane grows, you do not see that the sugarcane will become a trunk like a mango, right? That does not happen because sugarcane, which is a monocot, lacks cambium. If, it is, if cambium is present, then the big tree trunk can form. If cambium is absent, then it cannot form. Uh, since it is open to such a secondary growth, we call it open vascular bundle. Since it is closed for such secondary growth because of lack of cambium, we call this closed type of meristem. I'm sorry, closed type of uh, vascular bundles. So, we spoke about epidermal tissue, vascular tissue system. Now, let's talk about ground tissue system. If this is the epidermal tissue system, this is the vascular tissue system. Whatever lies in between is our ground tissue system. Okay. So, in ground tissue systems, you can find simple permanent tissues like parenchyma, colenchyma, sclerenchyma. So, um, parenchyma cells are usually present in the cortex. This region is usually called the cortex. Let me tell you. So, when you take a section of the stem, let's say this is a dicot stem. Outermost layer will be the epidermis. Below epidermis, you will have cells that comprise the cortex. Innermost layer of the cells, I mean innermost layer of the cortex, that is called the endodermis. Within the endodermis, you will have another layer of cells that's called the pericycle. Within the pericycle, you will have vascular bundles, which we just spoke about. And in between the vascular bundles, you will find tissue that is called medullary rays. At the center, you will find something called the pith. So all of these tissues from the cortex, endodermis, pericycle, medullary rays, pith, all of them are, they come under ground tissue. Okay. In leaves, you have upper epidermis, lower epidermis, between that whatever tissue will come, with, uh, that is the ground tissue and in leaves we call it the mesophyll. So that's about the ground tissue. With this, we have finished whatever was planned for today's lecture. I hope you kept up with everything that was taught. If you have any doubts, you can post them in the comment section. I will be more than happy to clarify them for you. I hope you've understood everything that was taught so far. I hope you will revise them before you come to the next class. So until I see you next class, take care of yourselves. Thank you.